Great. So thank you very much, Dr. Calabrese, for inviting me. This has been just a wonderful day. <clears throat> and uh, I've, I've learned a lot. I learned a lot just on the van ride up here last night from the airport. So uh, today I am going to be talking about uh, some, some work we've been, we've been dabbling in recently. Um, for those of you who don't know, that, that's Stone Mountain before they ruined it with, uh, with all the uh, Confederate soldier stuff. Okay, so conflict statement. I have no commercial interests. Um, just to remind you guys, we're talking about the eye. Here's a schematic of the eye. Uh, up front we have the cornea, then the lens. And back here we have the neural retina, okay? So light comes through here and it goes back and impinges on the retina. And this is a blow up of that. And the retina is made up of uh, three distinct neural layers, okay? Uh, the closest here is the retinal ganglion cell, then the inner, uh, inner retina uh, neurons, and then uh, photoreceptor cells out here. So light actually has to go all the way through here gets captured by the rod and cone photoreceptor cells. <clears throat> they uh, do some signal transduction. They communicate back to the inner neurons and then to the ganglion cells. And the ganglion cell axons actually make up the optic nerve, and that goes on and communicates with the brain. Okay? So what I've been doing for the last dec several decades is looking at what happens when these cells, the photoreceptor cells, and their support cells, the retinal pigment epithelium cells, what happens when they die, okay? And some of the bigger diseases in our field that involve that, that, that sort of death is age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, uh, retinitis pigmentosa, uh, lots of other retinal dystrophies. Uh, in our world, sometimes it's flavor of the day. Okay, so I'd love to be able to say that uh, I had uh, this real deep thinking behind what you're gonna see today and that we had all this hypothesis-driven work, but the reality is uh, different. I am part of a, a group, uh, the Center for Visual and Neurocognitive Rehabilitation. That's one of my two appointments. And um, I was sitting around having lunch with these guys one day, and um, these three guys, Bruce and Keith and Joe, had just published a paper about how spin exercise um, protected cognition in aging veterans, okay? And uh, the other retina person in the room, Michelle Pardue, says, hey, I wonder if exercise would protect against retinal degeneration. As she knows I've got a bunch of retinal degeneration models and we've been playing around with them for several years in developing neuroprotective drugs, okay? So that's the sum total of the thinking that went into this at that stage, all right? So we knew that it wasn't a total crazy idea because, you know, as we've heard a lot here today, there's lots of data out there that shows that in rodents uh, ex and in humans, exercise stimulates neurogenesis and improves memory and learning. Uh, we did know that there was, at the time, there was a handful of retrospective studies in the uh, age-related macular degeneration literature that indicated that people who uh, exercised more or, or more active at some level, they had later onset AMD or milder AMD. And then there was also a little bit of work out there showing that environmental enrichment, which always included access to a voluntary running wheel, would slow retinal function, or slow retinal function loss in the RD10 mouse model of retinitis pigmentosa. So there's a little bit of background on this, but we weren't really thinking about that. We thought it would be just kind of fun to exercise some mice. So at the time, one of the uh, favorite models in my lab uh, that we'd been using to to develop some drugs was the light-induced retinal degeneration model, or the leered mouse model. It's, it's a classic, possibly the most often used retinal damage, retinal degeneration model. Basically, you expose mice or rats to bright light, and that overdrives the visual transduction system, and you produce a whole bunch of oxidative damage, and you eventually have photoreceptor cell death, okay? And um, this retinal cell death is somewhat like some aspects of age-related macular degeneration. There's no really good macular degeneration models out there. This one certainly isn't a great one, but it does share some commonalities to the phenotype. And there's lots of different ways to do this light damage. You can do it with full spectrum light. You can do it with green light, blue light, what have you. So um, what, what we did originally was this. 
we took mice, we left them in their cages, and we set them on the floor, and we surrounded them by old gel boxes. Who even remembers gel boxes in this room? I know the youngsters don't. Okay, yeah. And desk lamps and everything. And we got this great response in terms of getting a retinal degeneration, and all kinds of other weird things were happening, and somebody walked by and said, that's because you're really heating these guys up. Uh, so we put down carboys full of ice water with these fans going, and that was our original light-induced retinal degeneration rig. And the first day that we actually got this working, the new president of the university happened to be touring the labs. He was a biomedical engineer, and he ended up spending the whole afternoon fondly reminiscing about his life and when he did crazy things like this. I wasn't able to get any extra money out of him, though. Um, we did eventually graduate to true light boxes. In any event, no expense was spared. Okay, so, so that's the basic how we did it. Now, how, how are we going to measure uh, our outcomes? All right, so um, we measure the retinal function similar to what we do in human clinic, and that's with the electroretinogram, okay? And essentially with rats or mice, what you do is you put an electrode on the cornea, and you put a, a couple of return electrodes in the body, and then you wheel your rodent into this light source. So it's kind of like it's, it's a sphere and you wheel it inside and you press a button and a big flash of light happens, okay? And what happens then is you get this characteristic potential trace across your two electrodes, okay? You get this negative excursion, which is the A wave, and that's actually measuring the function of your photoreceptor cells. And then you get this positive excursion, and that's the B wave, and you're measuring the bipolar cells or the neuronal activity in the, in the inner retina, okay? And this is not a very good representation of this, but uh, this, is, this is what it looks like in mice. Here's uh, the A wave with a follow-on B wave. That's your photoreceptor cell response. And that's your, this, the B wave is the inner retina response. And I have this up here to basically point out, this is from another experiment, a drug experiment, but to point out this is what happens when an animal was expo is exposed to dim light, regular room light or maintenance light, and this is what happens when its uh, uh, cohort or it, its partner is exposed to bright light or toxic light. And so you can appreciate that there's almost a complete loss of the uh, ERG amplitudes. A wave's tiny, B wave's tiny, okay? So that's basically what we're talking about here. And you can then, um, typically what you'll do with this is the flash of light that's coming, the stimulus that, that comes out of your orb um, gets brighter and brighter, and that way you get a bigger and bigger response. Or the other way around, you can go lower and lower and get a, a lower and lower response. And the data can then be, or often are shown this way when you quantify them. So the, these are the mean values, say, of your B waves in a dim exposed animal and in a light exposed animal be way, way down here, okay? So, point being that um, you'll be seeing data like this later on. Okay, so, how are we gonna exercise the mice? Well, we can get them a uh, rodent treadmill. They don't actually look like this. I, the, the day before we had this lunch, I was actually having lunch with an old professor of mine who do, who's a physiologist and a cell biologist, and he does treadmill work uh, looking at the effects of uh, sciatic nerve transection seeing if he can get recovery from that by running on treadmills. So I just had, hadn't had two lunches in a row, and I thought, I know where I can find a, a treadmill. Call him up, he loans us one, this is what they look like. So they're not, the mice aren't going very fast, it's about 10 meters per minute, and um, so now we've got a way to exercise our mice, okay? And he, and he must have liked me a lot, because I found out later on, these treadmills cost like $9,000 each. So I've now bought a few of my own. Okay. So our basic experiment, again, this is based on, on uh, the lunch conversation with the guy who's interested in sciatic nerve re regeneration. Uh, the basic experiment was we're going to start treadmill running our mice for about two weeks, and then two weeks in, we're going to give them the toxic light exposure, okay? And then we're going to let them run for another two weeks. And about a week into that, we're going to measure their retinal function by ERG. And then at week four, we're going to measure function again, and then we're going to sacrifice the animals and take their retinas or their eyes for uh, morphological examination. So half the animals are going to be treadmill exercise, 10 meters per minute for 
for 60 minutes, five days a week. We, of course, don't work on the weekends down in Atlanta. Um, so half of them are on treadmill, and the other half are on static treadmill, so that they're not run at all, okay? And then half of each of those are gonna be exposed to toxic light, and the other half in dim light. So it's a pretty straightforward experiment. And this is what we got. First crack out of the box, this is what we got. Here, these two are from the cohorts. These are ERG traces, okay? And these are from the cohorts that were uh, exposed to dim light, maintenance light, and you see a nice, big, healthy A wave, so the photoreceptors are working well. Follow on B wave, so the rest of the retina is working well, okay? Here's what happens to an animal that is exposed to bright, toxic light, but was not run on treadmills, okay? So this is not a very functional retina. This is from a litter mate that was exposed to the same bright light, but was allowed to run on the treadmill, okay? And it's not a huge difference, but it is uh, a difference and gave us hope. And so we continued this with several more animals. And this is what it looks like when you get your ends up to around 12 or 13. And so here we see this is the response in animals that both sets of these animals are exposed to bright light. And this is what it looks like uh, when uh, this, this is your A wave quantification uh, when you know, the animal is placed on a static treadmill. Uh, and this is the preservation of vision, of retina function, when the animal's allowed to run. And that's the follow-up, the corresponding B wave, the inner retina. Okay, so function looks great. What does morphology look like? Well, these are retina sections that <coughs> are fixed in H and E stain, or, yeah, H and E stain or toluidine blue stain, excuse me. And so what we're looking at here is the three neural layers of the retina, the retinal ganglion cell, inner nuclear layer, and outer nuclear layer, these are photoreceptor cell nuclei, and then out here are the inner and outer segments. This is the part of the photoreceptor cells that actually gather light. And we see in uh, these two examples from the dim exposed groups, a uh, nice big thick outer nuclear layer. There's lots of photoreceptor cells here. But this guy, who's exposed to bright light, we see he's down to one or two layers of photoreceptor cell nuclei and absolutely no inner or outer segments. So this is a total blowout retina, okay? This guy is basically blind. Again, this is a uh, litter mate who was allowed to run on the treadmill, and we see that there's wonderful preservation in the uh, outer nuclear layer. So there's a lot of photoreceptor cells there. There's even outer segments up here, which usually outer segments are the first things that get burned up in the, in the light damage model, okay? So, so that's pretty encouraging. And this is quantification of this. So it looked great. But when you go and actually quantify, what we're doing here is we're counting the number of nuclei. And what, what we do here is we start at the optic nerve head, and then we're counting the nuclei that are within regions out, uh, you know, 0.6 millimeter, 1.2 millimeter, uh, superior or inferior to the uh, optic nerve. And this, would, this is dim exposed animals, so that's the full complement of photoreceptor cells going across the retina. We see here that in the bright light exposed, that, that's pretty much blown out. And this is the uh, preservation that we get or, or the uh, protection we get uh, in number of photoreceptor cells with exercise. Okay, and that's just another quantification over here. Okay, so treadmill running protects against light and retinal degeneration. Um, it's pretty straightforward. How? Okay, well, I guess I don't need to explain to this crowd why you might want to look at BDNF, but we decided to look at BDNF. And what we did was we took a handful of our Balbsy mice and we ran them for nine or 10 days straight. And then we sacrificed them, uh, took various tissue, the brain, the hippocampus, and blood for serum, and we looked at BDNF levels. Okay. And so. Here, and we did this by ELISA, and here are the BDNF levels, protein levels in hippocampus and in serum. I'll tell you in a second, I don't believe the serum numbers anymore. But this is, this is very common what you, you get in the field, right? When you run animals on treadmills, run mice on treadmills, you get a, a relatively modest but reliable, statistically significant increase in BDNF levels, okay? And we looked in retina, and we get the same thing. That's the first time anybody bothered to look in retina after exercise, and we see this modest but reliable increase in BDNF. Well, that's nice, but that's not particularly important. 
uh, what you really want to do is ask, what happens if I remove BDNF signal transduction from the system? Will that preclude my protective exercise effects, right? So there's a compound out there that actually had become available about the time we were looking at this uh, and, and scratching our heads about this, and that is a track B, a BDNF track B receptor antagonist. It's specific for track B, doesn't seem to bind and, and block track C or track A, okay? And it was uh, also shown to specifically cross the blood-brain barrier when given systemically. Usually if drugs will cr cross the blood-brain barrier, they'll, they'll also cross the blood-retina barrier, okay? So we thought that we would try to block the effects of exercise by uh, treating our mice with this antagonist just before we put them on the treadmills, okay? And so we knew from the pharmacokinetic uh, studies done by the group that originated this compound, this antagonist, that it took about two hours for it to reach maximal dose in the brain. So what we did is we repeated the experiment I just showed you, only we included uh, an extra arm where uh, every morning we would come in and every morning that the animals were going to be run, we would come in and we'd give them a systemic injection, an IP injection of the antagonist. And then uh, two hours later, when we were predicting that the antagonist would be at its sites in the retina and in the brain, we would uh, commence the experiment that I just showed you. And the animals would run or they'd be on the inactive treadmill. And it, we'd do this for, again, the two weeks and then expose them to toxic light and then uh, look at function and morphology. And so here, these are the results from that. And here we're just looking at animals that were exposed to toxic light. This animal is an inactive animal exposed to toxic light. There's like a completely almost flat ERG. Uh, this is a litter mate that was exposed to toxic light but allowed to run on the treadmill, get this nice healthy A wave and B wave. Same group, only this time the animal is allowed to run on the treadmill, but it was given the antagonist, and we see that we are blocking the effects of exercise. Okay, so pretty, pretty straightforward story. Uh, that's just quantification of what we're talking about, and this is just quantification of the, of the um, photoreceptor cell number. So treadmill running, I'm, I'm going fast because we're running behind, sorry. Treadmill running pr protects against light-induced retinal degeneration. How? Apparently by increasing BDNF track B receptor activation. It appears in, in any event that B, BDNF track B receptor activation is requisite for this protective effect. Okay, so that was forced running on a treadmill. What about on a running wheel? Voluntary. It's less stressful. You can exercise young pups. We'll talk about this in a second because that becomes important if you're looking at a, a genetic model. Um, and we looked at it in, in the light damage model also, and essentially it's a simple experiment. Mice are put in, uh, or a, excuse me, a wheel's put in the mouse's cage, and, and the wheel's either locked or unlocked, okay? <coughs> and we let them run for two weeks, and then we expose them to the toxic light to induce light-induced retinal degeneration, and then we look a, a week later to see how their function is and how their morphology is, okay? So again, pretty straightforward experiment, and these are the data. This is uh, these are the ERG composite from uh, dim exposed mice. This is from bright light exposed mice that had locked wheels. So this is the delta for the experiment. This mouse can see, this, uh, this group of mice can see, this group of mice is pretty blind. However, if they're given wheels that worked and they ran on them, this is the amount of function that was preserved, okay? And that's actually a pretty decent amount. So very encouraging. Um, do the follow-up with the antagonist, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's the same as the treadmill story. Okay, so will exercise protect in a genetic model, in a genetic disease model? Because the light-induced model is like taking a big sledgehammer and whacking the animal on the head, okay? So if your approach works there, then it's probably going to work anywhere except for what? A genetic model where you've got the persistent, nonstop, always there problem that's being caused by the mutation. So um, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but the mouse that we chose, and we had a lot of experience with it, is called the RD10 mouse. It is a model of retinitis pigmentosa, and essentially 
it's got a mutation in one of the, the uh, visual transduction genes. And by postnatal day 16, so what we're looking at here is a retina that's kind of uh, diagonal, sorry about that. This is a ganglion cell layer, inner nuclear layer, and outer nuclear layer. And it looks really good here, but as we get out here to the periphery, we start to see breakup of the photoreceptor cell nuclei and loss of outer segments. And by postnatal day 18, you've really lost a lot of your photoreceptor cells. Okay, so it's a fairly early and fairly aggressive degeneration, but it's actually one of the slower ones in our field. So it's, it's why we, we used it. And again, we're doing some, what we did with the Leard, only a li here's a little twist. Um, the degeneration comes on so early that what we did was we took pregnant uh, moms and put wheels in with them, and uh, when the litters were born, they all got to play on the wheel, and they would actually stand there in line and, and goof around with each other and get on and run and run and get off, and then somebody else would get on and go and go and go. And then when they got to the point of being weaned, they would get weaned into cages that had either locked wheels or running wheels. Um, and I, I neglected to say, the moms, half the moms had locked wheels or running wheels, okay? So at time of weaning, the, the weanling would go into a cage with a, a locked wheel or an unlocked wheel, depending on what his mom had had or her mom had. Okay, so um, obviously I wouldn't be talking about this if it didn't work out the way, exactly the way we thought it would. And that is that uh, here are the uh, uh, ERG uh, A waves, I should say A wave. Um, the A waves and B waves for animals that had locked wheels versus animals that had wheels that worked, and you see that the animals that could run on the active wheels had significant preservation uh, of their retinal function. Okay, so with this strain, you can actually also measure acuity, and this is what you do with the human being. You put them in front of a Schnellen chart and see how far down they can read. You obviously can't do that with mice. But what you can do is you can uh, assess optokinetic tracking. It's kind of a neat thing. You have mice set in a, on a pedestal, and it's inside of four computer screens. And the computer is running a program that, for, in terms of what the mouse sees, uh, the mouse thinks it's sitting inside of a drum with a bunch of stripes. And you start spinning that drum, and the mouse will follow the motion of those stripes. Okay, and it's a reflex. And you can make the stripes, say the black stripes, narrower and narrower to the point where the, the mouse finally can't actually track anymore. And that threshold is a measure of acuity. Okay, it's, it's a pretty neat thing. You can do the same thing for contrast sensitivity by changing the darkness um, of, the, of the black lines until it's all grayed out. So, but we basically use it for visual acuity. So that's what you do for visual acuity in, in mice. And this is the effects of running wheel on visual acuity in the RD10 mouse. So here are wild type mice. They have this great high threshold. They have very good visual acuity. The RD10 mice, uh, as they're growing older, their visual acuity is getting worse and worse and worse. If they have a running wheel available to them and they run all the time, uh, we see that there's a big delay in the loss of that visual acuity. Okay, and that, That's actually a, a pretty big thing in our world. Uh, this is looking at the uh, morphology, and you know, basically it's showing similar to the light damage model that you have a preservation of photoreceptor cells when the animals can exercise. Okay. And that's the same thing showing that, that, that none of this works if you treat the animals with the antagonists. And I'm, I realize I'm skipping through this quickly. So treadmill training and wheel running protect against function and structure loss in both the damage model and a genetic model. And the protection is mediated by and requires BDNF track B activation. So now we're in the discussion portion. I can go through these real quickly. Um, usually when I present this to a bunch of ophthalmologists, they immediately say, what's the point? Nobody ever exercises. Well, I also then remind them that not in the not too distant past, people scoffed at prescribing vitamins and vegetables. And yet that's exactly what they do now based on research. Okay, so, and then they always say, well, but no one's, still no one's going to exercise. Well, it turns out that the most compliant patient population is the retinal degeneration patient population when they're dealing with, their, when they're working with their retina specialists, 
They're more compliant than any other patient population. And what I hear over and over again is because they see their loss every day. So some guy's had a heart attack and he knows he's supposed to be exercising. Well, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't because he doesn't wake up every morning and say, oh, I see that plaque just hit, okay? But some guy or some woman who's losing her vision, a lot of times, it might not be every day, but it can be weekly for sure, they wake up and they say, wow, I'm going blind. And so if you tell them to stand on their heads and spin like a top, because that's gonna slow down their vision loss, they do it. So that's, that's my little spiel that I always uh, talk to the clinicians about when they're resistant to this idea of prescribing exercise. Okay, so will we identify new mechanisms of health and disease, new therapeutic targets? This is what this is all about here. You guys are gonna be educating me on this because this is something that I really don't do. This is all done on the side. It was all done on the cheap, cobbling together. You'll get a good laugh if you look in the program to see how many names are associated with this because they're all a bunch of students doing everything for free and then a couple of us stupid PIs that hang out on the weekends. So is there a way to provide BDNF-mediated retinal neuroprotection? So in our field, I, I bring that up because in our field, we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on devices to deliver trophic factors to the retina and they failed miserably. Here, we're basically using exercise to have the body provide its own BDNF, its own trophic factor. So that's a point I try to make. Um, and then the things that are, are becoming near and dear to my heart, especially after uh, today, is, is, is the muscle acting as an endocrine organ? Is it sending out myokines? Is this protective preconditioning that we heard about earlier, right? Is it local hypoxia or is it remote ischemia? Are we making the, the leg muscles ischemic and somehow that, that's driving this? Um, or have we just discovered something that's silly about mice? And that's it. Thank you. So the short answer, so the question was, have we tested the hypothesis that reactive oxygen species are mediating the role of BDNF? And the answer, low level. Uh, low, right. No, we, we have not tested that. So th those are the type of things that I, I'll, I'm writing down this, this, over these two days. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So, so, so this is the other retina guy here, and he's asking me a retina question. He wants to know, have we looked at cones versus rods, and have we looked at RPE, the retinal pigment epithelium? Those are the cells that support the photoreceptor cells. Um, unless you're an RPE specialist and then they're the most important cells in the world. The, the short answer is yes, we've looked at cones specifically in the RD10 model and we do specifically preserve cone photoreceptor cells much longer than the rods. Now, I don't know if that's particular to exercise or not. So, most, you know, humans are pretty much cone driven given, given the opportunity <laughs> and that's always a, a, a critical question. Are you preserving cones or rods? Uh, we're preserving both, and I don't know if we're preserving cones simply because we're preserving rods longer, a longer amount of time. We see no loss of RPE, particularly in the RD10 model. In the light damage model, as you know, if we really crank up the light, we can cause uh, loss of RPE or disorganization, uh, but we haven't done that in, with the exercise animals. We, yeah, so, so the question is, have we been smart and looked at really profitable diseases? Um, no, we, we actually have. Uh, we, we have data on an STZ rat model, and uh, there is an exercise effect. Uh, I don't know enough about vascular changes. It's just not my background. Um, we, the changes are more subtle. It, it's not like these... Some of these changes that I'm showing with the ERGs might not be impressive to you guys, but that vision preservation that I just showed you, there's not a patient, there's not a human in the world that would go into their eye doc saying, doc, I don't see that well anymore, if they could see as much as what we're preserving in those animals. I mean, just, just a, say, a, a 5 or 10% preservation, and, and the human, a human will not go to the, the eye doctor because he wouldn't be able to detect that there's a problem. So. But, but back to the question about the diabetic uh, retinopathy. Uh, there's a lot going on with diabetic retinopathy, 
and it's even weirder, right, with the STZ mo rodent models. So uh, we do see preservation of um, cones, uh, cone photoreceptor cells. We see preservation of cone function. The rods seem to be all over the place, and we're having trouble getting a reliable response. Right. So, so the question is, 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 is this actually neuro, neuroprotection or is it that we are protecting neurons just because they, their vasculature is being protected? And that's, that's an excellent question. And I, we have not done anything to divine that out one way or the other. Right. So, and, and, and <laughs> at the time that I wrote that abstract, we, we, were, we were looking, so the question is, have we done dose response? Have we made the animals run faster? Have we, uh, you know, in, increased the incline? Have we done this, that, and the other? We were, we have not seen much of a dose effect at all. Now, we've only looked at increasing the running duration and uh, from, and this is with treadmills, uh, increasing the running duration from one hour a day to two hours a day. We've also done uh, our basic, our basic um, exercise is 10 meters per minute for one hour. We've done 5, 10, and 15 for an hour. We've done 20 for half an hour. We've, we've, we've played around with it. We've never seen anything that really is, is better than 10 meters per minute for one hour. We actually are starting to see better outcomes with five meters per minute for one hour, so less running. But don't take that to the bank. That's exactly two experiments with, again, you know, this is all, most of it's done by undergrads. Uh, there's a long list. <laughs> and so we would want to, of course, repeat the series experiments, which we have, uh, the, the experiments that we've published were repeated uh, several times in both of our, uh, in the Pardue lab and the Boatwright lab. Which is kind of, we were, we were doing this authentication and reproducibility thing before it was chic. Uh, we've done this with all of our drug development work for critical experiments. She'll do a set of experiments in her lab and I'll do the, the same experiments in my lab, but totally separate. Same mouse strains, but different colonies, different human beings, and everything's blinded. And then we double check each other's work.